Welcome to Podcast Bridging Voices, the podcast series of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. With Podcast, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with policy and decision makers in Europe. Hello everyone, I'm Farba Amir and I'm a research analyst with the Stimson Center's Energy, Water and Sustainability Program. On behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the Stimson Center, I'm pleased to present the International Hydro Diplomacy, Building and Strengthening Regional Institutions for Water Conflict Prevention pre-conference study. And to discuss how the contents of this study are relevant to the very important and timely topic of global water insecurity, and how is the EU working to expand its diplomatic initiatives in the area of transboundary water governance, I'm joined by two of the most dynamic women in the water sector. We have with us Ambassador Tanya Miskofa, who is in charge of water diplomacy and circular economy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia. During her diplomatic career, she served as the Director General for Multilateral Affairs and Development Cooperation and also as an ambassador to Egypt. And joining Tanya, we have Ms. Alina Belskaya, Political Advisor, Office of EU Special Representative for Central Asia at the European External Action Service. So without further ado, let's jump straight into today's conversation. Tanya and Alina, welcome. Thank you very much, Farwa. So, Tanya, I'll start with you first. This year, Slovenia holds its second presidency of the Council of the European Union, and water diplomacy ranks high on the Council's priorities as a deliverable and an urgent action item as well. Can you share some insights with our audience on how Slovenia is working to advance water diplomacy within EU and across borders, taking the Council's goal forward, that is, and any notable initiatives you would like to mention? Yes, of course, with with pleasure, Farwa. Well, here in Europe, we we know from our long experience that the benefits of transboundary cooperation on water measured against the costs are much higher for all riparian states, including upstream countries. And Slovenia is a great case in point. We are a water-rich, mostly upstream upstream country, yet uh, we were instrumental in bringing about the first regional agreement Um, after the bloody conflict in Western Balkans, which was the international agreement on the Sava River Basin, which today ranks number one on the Blue Peace Index, we saw that taking a very strong potential source of conflict off the table would benefit the regional peace and security. And not only that, it helped build trust for cooperation in other fields. So seeing firsthand that water can be an instrument of peace, transboundary cooperation can be an instrument of peace, we put water diplomacy and the water and peace nexus at at the forefront of our foreign policy. And we have been actively raising awareness of this nexus, particularly at the UN uh, in Geneva, where we co-established together with Switzerland, Costa Rica and Senegal, the group of friends on water and peace. And we're also active in New York. We have been actively promoting transboundary water cooperation, including through our engagement in the work of the UNECE Water Convention, which we will chair from uh, 2024 to 2027. And globalization of this uh, formidable instrument will be one of our priorities. Now, support for integrated water resources management and transboundary water cooperation has been a mainstay of the EU water diplomacy and the concept of water as the regional public good and water cooperation as promoter of regional integration are its key principles. We have the EU Council conclusions on water diplomacy from 2018, which Slovenia was uh, one of the driving forces of, and and they're still very relevant. There is ample space for the EU water diplomacy to play a stronger role in promoting sustainable, inclusive water management and cooperation, mediating and helping to prevent water-related conflicts, as well as contributing to post-conflict resilience by assuring that water is taken into consideration. However, we saw the need for a more comprehensive set of conclusions that would while further strengthening the EU water diplomacy, also better reflect water's cross-cutting nature and relevance for human development, preservation of ecosystems, climate resilience. So our aim is to firmly embed a comprehensive approach to water across all aspects of EU external action through a new set of council conclusions on water. So within the three pillars, development, humanitarian, and peace, 
They will also include aspects such as health, food security, nutrition, and other aspects of human development, green recovery, resilience, etc. And, and we're talking about a human rights-based and gender responsive approach. We're talking about inclusive, multi-stakeholder engagement as the only one for which water-related challenges can be efficiently addressed. And in preparation for, for this effort, for our presidency, we conducted extensive consultations with, with different NGOs, uh, SAOs, the European Parliament member states, and organizations like Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the Simpson, Simpson Center. And we were lucky that our efforts also coincide with the EU programming as, exercise, as of course we want to, see, to raise the visibility of water in, in EU financing. And, and just one more important task I would like to mention, which we uh, will be hopefully strongly reflected in the Council of Conclusions, is the need for the EU to be a driver of an accelerated global action on water in the run-up to the 2023 UN Water Conference. We would like to see an action-oriented, comprehensive approach that entails all cross-cutting aspects of water, including transboundary water cooperation and its relevance for international peace and security reflected in the outcomes of this conference. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya, because all that you have said, it shows how much commitment there is towards uh, the water security challenge in general, whether it's transboundary or within the EU borders as well. Um, there are strong ambitions out there. And you talk about putting water peace nexus at the forefront of the foreign policy for Slovenia. And not only that, but also as a part of the EU Council conclusions, pushing that forward. So my next question to you both, actually, and I would love Alina to also share her perspectives on this, is that how can EU's diplomatic tools and policies be improved in a timely manner to address the broader development and economic and security challenges that are emerging from water scarcity? And you, uh, Tanya, in your uh, response, just touched upon some of those initiatives. But with changing times and how things are literally evolving by the day here, owing to the pandemic or owing to the different variations you're seeing and seeing in conversations around climate change. I would love to hear from you as to what needs to be done. First, it's extremely important to understand well the interplay of different factors and nexuses in order to devise adequate contextualized responses and avoid negative externalities which can cause tensions and conflicts. Our activities on water need to be conflict sensitive and risk informed and our peace interventions on the other hand need to be waterproofed by evidence-based, context-specific, gendered understanding of water's role throughout the conflict cycle. And water needs to be systematically embedded into EU's preventive peacebuilding, peacekeeping intervention needs to be part of the relevant strategic partnerships and political dialogues. And this is something that is already happening. We need to better develop situational analysis and awareness, and, and this is already happening through the through the early warning system and, and its global conflict risk index, which now includes indicators such as climate and, and water stress. We need improved operational guidance on implementing the humanitarian development peace nexus when it comes to water. Water must be integrated into strategic thinking and security and defense planning, So, which means mainstreaming climate and environmental uh, aspects into uh, civilian and military missions mandates and uh, also having environmental advisors as a standard position in missions and operations, and also having ex environmental experts on, EU, on the teams of EU special representatives. We have one on, on the EU special, on the team of the EU special representative for Central Asia, as Alina, I'm sure, will explain. But I, we, we believe that all, uh, also EU special representatives for the Horn of Africa, for the Sahel, for the Middle East peace process, should also, you know, uh, be aware of, of these issues and, and have an environmental expert in their teams. Fantastic. This is the idea of awareness and knowledge sharing, as uh, I'm hearing from your response. Alina, what would be um, your thoughts on this? Thank you, Tanya, for excellent scene set. We'll start maybe with uh, something where I think we are not as good as we could have been. And here I would like to actually mention that where we could improve is actually in uh, implementing the commitments that we have undertaken under the sustainable development goals our paris commitments unfortunately the attainment of sustainable development goal six which relates to water is off track and um, hinders progress on the 2030 agenda for sustainable development 
I understand from my colleagues, the work on water is fragmented across sectors and institutional bodies, while current levels of financing remain inadequate to reach these targets. I hope that uh, our future endeavors and uh, our future work uh, will target uh, also some of these uh, deficiencies. The other thing which I would like to stress and support your opinion and uh, uh, your work on is uh, search for different nexuses. For example, in our work, we see the importance of water energy ecosystem or water energy uh, food security nexuses. So it's no longer, or our approach is more or should be, uh, and we're trying it out in a more comprehensive way uh, to address uh, these issues. The other thing uh, I think where we could do better, and also echoing what Tanya said previously, is the Team Europe approach. Europe has a lot of interesting examples. I think Europe probably has also technology and knowledge and expertise to address uh, water-related issues. And I think we need to pull together the work of the EU institutions, the work of the member states to um, enhance the effectiveness of our approach. As I mentioned uh, previously, that the levels of financing remain inadequate for the challenge that we're facing. And I think finding different ways and different disciplines and different stakeholders to help us not only advance the knowledge and the expertise, but also to finance our ambitions would be very important. And finally, I would like to say something which resonates with me personally, and I hope it will resonate with regular people, is actually we really, really need to be careful in uh, balancing our needs, our human needs, with the needs of the water systems and the eco systems. I know that development is important, but also it has to be quite sustainable. Thank you. And thank you so much, Alina. That certainly does resonate with me, and I'm sure it resonates with most people who agree that we need nature. Nature doesn't need us. So we need to make sure that our development is sustainable going forward if we want a secure future for ourselves and for the generations to come. And on that note, we should move on to our pre-conference study, which was introduced earlier in the conversation. The study was designed to highlight the need for an inclusive, and pragmatic approach to transboundary water governance at both regional and international levels. The chapters of this study each focus on three of the most water-stressed and conflict-prone regions of the world, Central Asia, Himalayan region, and the Middle East and North Africa, provides examples of how traditional approaches and political complexities between countries have all contributed to weaker governance and management of transboundary water resources in these regions. So Alina, with that, I want to turn to you to just ask, what were some of your initial reactions to the study? Please feel free to share any takeaways you found helpful when you were perusing the study that you could use towards your work or the broader work that uh, the European External Action Service does in water stress regions. I would like to thank the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the Stimson Center for doing this study. It is an important study and I think it's a very good food for thought because in our work we cannot stress enough the urgency of the need to work on water-related issues and access between water and conflict. And slowly I think people start to understand the urgency of addressing this issue, but unfortunately, quite often it takes human tragedies uh, for um, promoting uh, action. I actually, in my work, I noticed that we get more and more interest, we get uh, more and more requests and more and more urgency for working on water after a terrible drought that hit Central Asia this year. And I hear from at the very uh, high level uh, also in quite um, many conversations that water is going to be very important also on the Central Asia um, EU agenda even more than before, even though previously it was also one of the top agenda items. I must say that you have um, taken upon yourself a very uneasy task in this study because trying to address water governance actually is one of the most uh, difficult topics, but it is actually at the core of the matter 
in your study, you talk about uh, IFAS, which is the International Fund for Saving the RLC. And indeed, IFAS is um, the backbone of the regional integration process on water and uh, probably the most advanced of all sectors in Central Asia. From our perspective, an empowered IFAS uh, organization with all the Central Asian countries on board would be a strong signal for regional economic cooperation with potential spillover also in other sectors, starting from energy, transport, and trade. As you know, on issues like this, uh, we prefer to have a, a regional approach because we think it will bear more results. There are many small initiatives on uh, the um, recommendations that uh, you mentioned in the um, study. Things like fostering basin-wide uh, cross-sectoral and inclusive coordination and strategic planning, clear mandate, capacity and funding for regional water organizations, strengthening homegrown institutions uh, in a comprehensive approach and supporting uh, research, education, innovation and unconventional thinking. According to uh, my experience and my knowledge, many of these um, recommendations uh, have been taken on board, but uh, quite many of them are still um, at the level of um, small initiatives, and really we need to amplify them. We need to make sure that these initiatives grow into something that can then develop into something bigger, into a driver, um, as you say, for cooperation on um, water in the region. This is, I think, where your study also makes um, a very good contribution to the general debate and sort of to this push for cooperation. Just uh, a note, in a way, from uh, our, uh, from my side, I found it extremely interesting, your recommendation on identifying drivers uh, for cooperation and uh, I wouldn't uh, mind uh, reading more about this in-depth uh, research, uh, more thinking about what it could be and how to harness. But all in all, I would say really this study also contributes to building a momentum for the 2023 Water Conference, which is one of the uh, important milestones in our work. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, and also uh, just for finding uh, insights that uh, you thought were important and you uh, could relate to in terms of the work that you do. And also you found uh, different recommendations that were helpful. And also uh, you touched upon this in your response as well on Central Asia. And I realized that you do have an excellent portfolio of work in Central Asia in terms of the transboundary water management work. So uh, if you would like to just elaborate on how the EU is engaging with the region, because it's, you know, as you see in the study, it is one of the regions that is high priority for us as well. And there are a lot of recommendations that you just mentioned that have been taken on board, but they're still being dealt on the surface level. So in your work experience and ongoing work or work that you've already covered in the past, what has the EU done uh, within Central Asia to kind of take forward some of this kind of work where you are, you've you seen success and that can be used as best practices in the other regions that we talk about in the study. EU engagement in the Central Asia region has um, contributed to infrastructure investment, irrigation, pollution prevention, wastewater treatment and more, and uh, also supports the establishment of national policy dialogues. We see Central Asia is facing increasingly severe environmental challenges and uh, the combined impact of climate change has already started to reduce water flow by shrinking the glaciers that feed Central Asian rivers. But this development combined with population growth will exacerbate some of the region's environmental concerns with potential implications for economic development, security and migration. And I think one of the um, innovative approaches that uh, I find uh, um, interesting is uh, what I mentioned before, that we're searching for nexuses between uh, different areas where combining uh, expertise in different areas, we can address water-related issues uh, more efficiently and uh, help people um, deal with um, 
with these um, issues. Also, I think what uh, we're trying uh, to do and hopefully uh, with a, a degree of success is to continue to promote um, a regional approach to cooperation in the field of environment, water and uh, climate uh, change. And at the same time, promoting the regional agenda for water peace and prosperity as the key for uh, the implementation of a document or a key document on Central Asia that we have in the EU is uh, our EU Central Asia strategy, which was adopted in 2019 and uh, identify as water uh, sector as one of the priorities on which the EU uh, should be working. In terms of um, successful examples, I think here we would need to look at some of the products um, that have been uh, implemented on the um, ground. And I think there are quite interesting projects related to uh, mitigating the um, impact of the disappearance of the Aral Sea, as well as uh, projects uh, trying to bring together like different stakeholders, not only state officials, but uh, different stakeholders like think tankers, academics, also students to understand these issues better, to be the thinkers and the future activists on these um, issues. These I found to be very interesting uh, projects from my personal perspective, because in a way, what they do is that they make this big issue very human in a way, and it makes uh, those who participate in this project feel that their actions actually contribute to solving this problem. Right. Thanks, Alina. And you talked about something that, you know, we see, I mean, I look at the Himalayan region and the Middle East, North Africa as well, in terms of the water scarcity and um, the geopolitical scenario that goes along with it. Uh, one of the areas that you know, we've been also as, as, Cass and Stimson, both through our work, have been trying to push for is the regional cooperation, which you talked about, and the multi-stakeholder engagement aspect. It's so important that when we talk about issues around water, climate security, that that you involve people who are the most uh, affected by it. And it goes back to something that Tanya also mentioned earlier, uh, to have an integration with all aspects of human life. You need to see how it affects your economy. How does it affect the humanitarian side of things? How it how it's combined with peace? So you you see that as, as a recurring theme. So regional cooperation is something that can change the course of uh, the course of life and the course of things that uh, we are we are experiencing at the moment and hopefully for the better. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Tanya now. Tanya, you've been an important part of all our efforts uh, since last year and, and, and actually before on promoting regional and international hydro diplomacy. We had the pleasure to have your participation in our regional joint working group meetings as well on all of these regions. So it would be wonderful if you could share your experience with the research and dialogues that Cass and Simpson have jointly produced views uh, so far, including our pre-conference study. So, Tanya, please take us home. For, for my ministry, it was extremely useful to be part of this exercise, especially in preparation for our EU presidency. It gave us very important insights and understanding of the regions, especially in view that we have, you know, limited diplomatic presence in some of the regions. And uh, this was a, a, a really, really useful and learning uh, exercise for us. And my, my main interest with it, and, and this was to learn what are the expectations of, of the countries from these three basins towards a possible role of, of EU, uh, EU water diplomacy and uh, what would be or which would be the most efficient entry points. So, for example, you know, when, when it comes to mediation and water related conflicts, the EU can perhaps be more effective if it, if it works with a partner organization like the OECE, for example, in Central Asia. But, but there are other ways in, in which EU uh, can be very useful and you state them in your study like development and technical assistance, disaster response and relief, scientific co collaboration, capacity building, climate change action, etc. It states the need to promote river-based ecosystem, the nexus approach, 
an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach. Um, this is something that we, you know, we believe, but we were happy to have this, this reconfront and not only breaking the silos, but also to provide the capacity to do, do so. This is something that's a very important takeout. So those are the ways, the appropriate pathways to address the weak institutional capacity, which you, which you state as, as one of the main challenges in all three regions. How do we address the politicization and the securitization of water? As a factor restraining the, the transboundary water cooperation, how do we converge to scientific expert level and the political level? So these are the, the most difficult questions. And, and I think first and foremost, we in, in, in the European Union need to understand better the specific sociopolitical and cultural context and, and devise appropriate entry points from that. And climate change, given its transboundary effects, may actually bring the necessary change in perception first of addressing water-related challenges across borders. And, and I believe it presents an opportunity for, for established transboundary cooperation where it does not exist, for example, through joint risk assessment, which would lead to joint proposals for solutions, or let's say upgrading the existing institutional mechanisms with based on wide climate adaptation provisions, which, which then opens the door to modernizing and better oper operalized, um, operalization of those mechanisms. Finally, what, what may be the biggest challenge, changing the narratives, which, which represent obstacles to, to cooperation. So how do we promote benefit sharing mindset? This, I think, is something we'll, we'll still have to figure out. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all love the sound of a benefit sharing mindset, and hopefully that's where the world is headed to. But thanks a lot, Tanya and Alina. It was an absolute, absolute pleasure to have you both. I learned a lot. And to everyone listening to us right now, please visit Cass's and Stimson's website to get your hands on the pre-conference study. I guarantee you it'll be well worth your time. I would also like to thank all our contributing authors, Dr. Nilanjan Ghosh, Mr. Deepak Giawali, Dr. Jennifer Sering, Dr. Tugba Madan, and Mr. Hamza Hassan Sharif for their wonderful work with the study. Lastly, the podcast will be incomplete without me asking you to follow Cass and Stimson on all our social media channels. You'll find the links in the description box below. Thanks again and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. With podcasts, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with policy and decision makers in Europe. We encourage and facilitate open dialogue on current global issues. At CUS MDPD, we design and implement multi-stakeholder dialogues, focusing on the nexus of democracy and governance, peace and security, and climate and energy. Thank you for tuning in to Podcast Bridging Voices. Join our LinkedIn community, tag us in your tweets, and add us on Facebook, on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Visit our website for our latest publications.